guys, so um, I decided to make a YouTube video to find a root locus of a transfer function. Um, my name is Kelsey Cameron. I'm currently taking linear control systems, and I believe that there's not enough uh, resources and stuff like this on YouTube. So I'm going to try to explain it in a different way. So when I look at this function, I know that I have one zero and two poles. These for in terms of real zeros and real poles. So that what does that mean? That means if I plot, if I create a graph here, we got my graph going on. This is zero, one, and negative one. I can go ahead and just plot the zeros and the poles right now. So I know that a, the zero of this function is going to be negative one because if I plug in s equals negative one, negative one plus one equals zero, and it's a, it, it's all zero, the whole thing. Because if you divide by zero, or if you divide from zero, then it's going to be zero. So you can draw the zero at negative one right here, and then there's two poles at positive one. How do I know it's positive one? Because if I plug in a one here, then that denominator becomes zero. And I know there's two of them because this is the same thing as s minus one times s minus one. It's the same as s minus 1 squared. So if I plot both of them, one here and then one here, I'm actually plotting 2 um, at this point. Um, I forgot in the problem to include a constant k. Usually that's in these problems. It's not absolutely necessary, but it can be at times. It just depends on what the problem asks. And so let's say I wanted to know what k is at each of these things. Well. For our zeros, if this if this is zero, then then we know that k is going to be equal to infinity at our zeros, and k is going to be equal to zero at our poles. Because I like to think of it as whatever you're not focusing on, it's the opposite of that. So like if you're looking at the denominator and setting it to zero to find the poles, then your k is going to be zero. Anyway, so I know, what do I know about the root locus? Well, I know that the root locus exists at the left, on the positive real axis on the left of an odd number of singularities. Well, what is a singularity? Singularity is either a pole or a zero. So there's two poles here. So that means it doesn't exist here, it doesn't exist here, but it exists from here on out. So I'm going to go ahead and draw this. Remember when you're doing the root locus that it always goes away from the poles and towards the zeros. Towards zeros away from poles. So I'm just going to go ahead and draw the arrow going towards the zero. Now, we need to calculate our variables. So we're going to need to know what alpha is. Alpha stands for how many asymptotes you have. Number of asymptotes. And alpha can be found by taking the number of poles and subtracting the number of zeros. So that means that alpha is going to be, we have two poles, two real poles, and one zero. So two minus one. And that is equal to one. And then we can use alpha to figure out the origin of our asymptote. So this, is, this means we have one asymptote. I'll write that down. And then uh, uh, sigma is going to be the origin of the asymptote. And this is equal to the sum of all pole locations minus the sum of all zero locations divided by alpha. That looks pretty complex, it's really not that hard. Because when you plug it in, you get the pole location at 1, so that's 1 plus 1, so that's 2. And then we're at negative 1, so 2 minus a negative divided by alpha, which is 1. So 2 minus negative 1 is, is 3. 3 divided by 1 is 3. So that means 3, or rather x equal x s equals 3 is the origin of our asymptote what does that mean well that means you can go 
to s equals 3, and this is where your asymptote is going to be. So, most likely, um, you are going to have to use the angle condition in order to figure out what, what angle these asymptotes make, because we don't know this angle at all. So in order to find the angle of those asymptotes, it's going to be equal to 180 times n divided by alpha. And n is a positive or negative odd number. So that means that our angle measures are going to be plus or minus 180 plus or minus 360 dot dot dot. That means that the only, we, the only one we have, because 80 is a multiple of 360, we can go ahead and ignore 360. That means starting at 3, the only asymptote we have is going this direction. It's on the axis, so it doesn't really help us at all. So what's actually going to happen? Well, we know that somehow we are at these two poles, and we need to get to this 0. Notice nothing's actually connecting this. Like, I didn't keep drawing this that way. Um, not yet, anyway. <laughs> So when we have two poles right here, what's going to actually happen, because there's two of them, and they can't go to the left and they can't go to the right, they're going to branch apart. One's going to go up and one's going to go down. When that happens, it loops around like this. And then the bottom one also loops. So that's our root locus, um, but we actually still have another zero, because the number of poles always has to equal the number of zeros. I don't mean real poles, I mean real and imaginary. So basically that means that we are forced to have an extra imaginary pole at negative infinity, because let's say you plug in negative infinity here, well that's, that's, that's going to make, um, if I plug in negative infinity for s, that's going to make this, this whole function approach 0. So when I do that, I can split off the axis here and then get to negative infinity. And that's a 0 at negative infinity. So the root locus... Sorry, that's a pole at negative infinity. My bad. Yeah, from the poles. No, it's a, it's a zero. It's a zero. Sorry. That's a zero at minus infinity. And the reason it's a zero is because if I plug in infinity here for us, then it's going to approach zero. In, yeah. Which means that at this point, k should be equal to infinity. And that's my root locus. As you can see, I went through all the different steps. Basically what I did, first step, I listed all my poles and zeros. Second step, calculated alpha. Alpha is the number of poles minus the number of zeros. Then I used alpha to find sigma. Sigma is the origin of the asymptote, and that's equal to the, the pole locations minus the zero locations divided by alpha. Sigma is the same thing as the origin of your asymptote. In our case, using the angle condition, we figured out that the origin of the asymptote makes a 180 degree angle with the positive real x-axis, so that didn't help us figure it out. But since we knew that the, the root locus always goes from the poles to the zeros, then we were able to figure out that it's going to branch out and loop all the way back around. You're probably wondering, oh, well, how, what's the breakaway point? What is the re-entry point? Well, as you can clearly see on this graph, the breakaway point's going to be at 1, um, because that's just where they break apart. And this actually makes a circle. A circle with radius... Um, circle with radius should be a radius of 1, I believe. Actually, wait, maybe it might not make a circle. Nope, it, I don't think it does in this problem because it's too far apart. 
Um, but if this were at zero, yeah, if this if this pull or if this zero were moved to zero right here, if I scooted that over, then it would make a circle with a radius of one. But since it's over here, it makes an oval. And the way you find this re-entry point is you take the characteristic equation, which is going to be 1 plus ks plus 1 over ks minus 1 squared. And then you use it to solve for k. Once you have solved for k, um, then you take the derivative of k and set it to 0. And use that to solve for s, and at that location is where your re-entry point is. Hopefully all of that made sense. If it didn't, feel free to ask me questions or make any corrections that you think that I may have missed. Um, I hope that clarifies a few things and you're not as confused as I was when I first heard a lecture on this. Thank you. Have a great day.